All right, everybody, welcome to the Tactical Games Podcast. I am here with uh, Zach Rodman again, who refuses to leave my house, and uh, James Gill, uh, who's actually the newest full-time member of the Tactical Games staff. So James came on last year as kind of like a contractor helping us out with events and is now full-time with the Tactical Games. So a big round of applause for, for James. James. Thank Glad you. Glad to have him on board. Him. You're not clapping for him? Not yet. Okay, so... Um, we just got back from Centex, a uh, local three-gun match. We all shot in the two-gun division and uh, got appropriate, appropriately spanked by Gil. Um, and then I handed Zach the L. And then um, we both got beat by uh, Sal and I think yeah, it Ben Pena beat us too. Um, but never here nor there. Um, that was your first experience shooting a match outside of the tactical games. What was your takeaway? What did you think? You know, what do you? You're, what you, I'm, you're I, asking I, you're, me. It's definitely not Gil's first time well, shooting laid, a match outside of the tactical games. I laid a steaming pile on the long range <laughs> stage. Um, it was a lot of fun. There were. Uh, I was in a really good heat. Yeah, obviously. I would say so. Yeah. Or whatever you guys call it. Yeah. Uh, squad. Squad. Yeah. And uh, but everybody was really nice. But they were really good, and it was fun to watch. And I learned a ton uh, just by watching these guys move through. I bother Gil quite often. Um, because we shoot for the same, shoot for the same company. We've been friends for a while, but he helps me out too. But it was nice to hear some things from some other guys. Yeah, that have been around that sport a long time. Yep, and they were all, they were all really helpful, really nice. And then when they said go, it was on just like the rest of us. Yep, pretty cool to watch. Yeah, Jared was out there. He put a hurting on both of us as well. Yeah, handedly kicked the shit out of us. It's funny because he limps around like I'm so <laughs> oh, injured. injured. And then there's like this video on his Instagram where he's like. Running the speed limit. Yeah, yeah. I'll remember that. You know, the team event in Texas here in a couple months, Jared. Where he says he's going to help you lift the 300 pound sandbag and then just looks at you until you do it. He's like, listen, we'll do the 300 pound sandbag. I'll do it. I'll do it the first time. You do it the second time. And then he like casually leans his arm on the yoke. Do it. <laughs> All right, so Gil, uh, you had a couple amateurs in your squad again today, mm -hmm. and uh, you've always been a huge help in helping people. Like, what what has shooting other sports outside of the tactical games become for you? Uh, well, really, shooting any of the competitive shooting events is it's an addiction that I I can't shake. So there's every event I go to, I probably find a dozen things that I need to work on. Yeah. Um, I, I've played other sports over the years where I'm good at, and it just, uh, I keep winning, I ah, win again, win again. And you, then it, you just slack off on what you're doing. And so it's nice to go to different events that you're not completely comfortable with. It's nice to go to different locations for events. It's nice to be the new guy in a squad and one, you make new friends, but two, you find out, Hey, I wasn't ready for this. Um, you know, Zach and I were talking last night and he was asking me a couple questions about, well, what's it going to be like with the squad we're on? Are they, like, I'm new to this. What are they going to do? And I said, oh, they're going to immediately trash on you. They're going to they're gonna tell jokes, and they're going to, at your expense, you get three minutes usually for a new guy, but then it's going to become 60 <laughs> so seconds. So it's like a tactical game. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you're going to have a high level of competitors that come through, and they all started somewhere. So yep. they, they remember that. It doesn't matter what sport it is. They know, I started somewhere. I was completely new to this. I didn't know anything. And back in the days where we didn't have the internet the way we do now, yep. um, the information wasn't there. So, like, you're jumping into it completely blind. And Zach jumped in on the squad with us. And I told him, most of the guys in the squad are going to beat the bricks off you. But they're going to tell you everything you need. They're going to, you need to borrow my equipment, whatever it is. Um, and because they're so good, whenever they tell you, how you're doing on a stage, you can a hundred percent believe that. Like, I don't, I'm not worried about your feelings. This new guy in a sport. Right. So like if you do terrible, I'm gonna be like, Hey, you're really terrible at this. You should work on this. <laughs> but when you do something good, we're going to point that yeah. out. And, and it's nice to have a whole squad of people, you know, that jump in. And like, when you do something good, you might not even hear it in the moment because you're so worried about your own stage, but like people are like excited for you. Yep. Um, and, with the outside matches that we go to, it's nice to experience different crowds of, hey, you've done this. And, and they all know that you're not proficient in this sport or you're the new guy in the sport. Uh, so it's nice to be involved in multiple multiple sports to find out what you're bad at. Yep. I uh, So I've shot 
a few matches in Texas here now, and I generally shoot with the same group of people. Um, and the, a lot of the people that I shoot with are the people's people whose names are on the top of the leaderboard in every different division. So the first time I squatted with that group and I went out and shot a match, I was like, holy shit, is this just how people shoot three gun? <laughs> like, this is fucking ridiculous. And then you start to realize like, oh, okay, these are some of the top people in this sport. Yeah. So yeah. going and shooting with a different squad, then you're a little bit more comfortable because, not, and I don't want to say comfortable, it's a little bit, it's not at such a fast pace. Yeah. So you don't have that intimidation factor around you all the time. But like you said, Everybody in that sport that I've had the opportunity to shoot with has been incredibly inviting. It's been willing to teach. I mean, like those guys have taught me a ton, and that's why I've seen noticeable improvements in shooting. Well, if you go to CrossFit or Strongman and you go to the world event and you're with the title contenders yep. and you're the new guy to that event, you're, of course, going to get the bricks beat out of you. And, you know, so going to a shooting competition and you're you're worried about how you're performing. Am I training well? Am I doing good? So if you're in the gym with those superstar athletes, it's super demoralizing because you're like, I will never be at this level. Yeah. But then you look to the regular gen pop, like your peer, your real peer group. You're like, okay, I'm doing something good here. It helps to be around superstar athletes, yep. superstar shooters, people that are like-minded and want to chase perfection. Right. Because, uh, you know, if you're – we all talk about like being back in our hometown and like your high school crowd that never went, never left their town yep. and they're all just working at dollar general, or whatever. Like you have dollar general. I don't and you know have... that anybody's working when they're at dollar. I mean, <laughs> have you been into a dollar general? Lane? There's stuff everywhere. You know, but you have I... 26 flavors of beanie weenies. But I, yeah, <laughs> but I keep going back, but I always keep going back. Yeah, yeah. When we go to these matches, it's like, look for a dollar general because they have everything, but you're going to have to look for it. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So, so being able, being able to find that difference of confirmation of what you're doing, you know. So we talked about it previously of people that are constantly looking at the programming that we put out or whatever program they're following, and they they're worried about their performance as it stacks up. Not to just the person to their left and the right who's a recreational or a hobby fitness athlete or a fitness shooter. I want to know how I'm stacking up to the people that are day in and day out doing what I'm doing. So yeah. you talk about skirmish program yep. and certain things where, Hey, this is something at a national level to measure what you're doing. And there's nothing like the shooting sports. Uh, you know, I told you last night, there's a good chance you can get beat by a 15 year old girl. <laughs> and if it wasn't like legit, if it wasn't for a 15 year old girl beating the bricks off me, when I first started shooting, I would have no motivation to continue shooting. Right. I'd be like, ah, I'm right better than these old guys. But I'm like, Ooh, like, why, why is this person beating me? I should be able to beat them. Now I'm just like on the hunt for perfection. Um, so today's match was a lot of fun. You know, some people aren't too happy about their scores, but um, come back next month. I mean, <laughs> gonna fly back down your I, told, I was telling Nick and Jared, like, uh, this would be something super addicting to do. But the weekends typically belong to my boys. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're traveling with baseball or basketball or whatever. So. Uh, but it's definitely like after the first stage, I don't even know how I did on the first stage. I was like, this is awesome. You walked off with the biggest shit eating grin on your face. Nah, like, I, I just got to shoot fast. Probably did terrible. <laughs> so we were wrong. Because uh, some of it translates, right? A lot, 100%, a lot of it translates yeah. from what I, from what we are expected to do. The ability to quickly see and acquire targets. like And transition. Uh, yeah, transitions. Yeah. yeah. It's relevant. Yep, absolutely. So it, Relevant in what you do for a living yeah. and relevant in our sport as well. And, you know, obviously today we shot a two-gun division and a three-gun match, but I would say the same goes for going out and shooting like an SPR DMR match or shooting PRS, shooting um, like PCSL. There's a lot of options out there. And people, I think, you know, may, might be intimidated. Go out and find a community, find a group around you, find a local match and see if you know somebody there. And if you don't, I'm sure that you can go there for your first time and they'll welcome you with open arms. I, I We want to continue to see... The shooting sports grow. We want to continue to see people get involved from our community, get involved in other shooting sports. It's only going to raise the level of proficiency in our shooters. So uh, I'm all for that, and I uh, would love to see more of those continue to grow. Um, so are you gonna you're gonna try it again? You're gonna come back maybe later in the year, go home practice a little bit, and then maybe come back and try to reclaim that W. Some of the guys on our team, our SWAT team actually, um, have picked it up and a couple of patrol. Wait, are you a cop? No. Oh, okay. All right. I mean, I wear a uniform, but. <laughs> One would argue, <laughs> but it's uh, it, the guys on the team have caught the bug, 
we take we take our team to SWAT Roundup every year. Yep. Um, so the guys are always looking for you know some goals or benchmarks throughout the year to stay sharp. For sure. For competition later in the year and tactical games being one of them. Um, but yeah, they'll go do like steel challenge. Yep. Every, every once in a while and um, a couple of like local local matches. But yeah, I've always wanted to make it out to one, but like being away from home, you know, this weekend enabled me to do and peer pressure. That. Yeah, there was a lot of peer there pressure that in that too. Yeah, and for the there record, that. top third first event. Yeah, so, you, so came, you, did you did well, and I think I, I didn't beat you by much. It was a close. It was close. Go check out practice score. You can see the results from that one. It was close. yeah, and a couple points, match points. Um, all right, so you guys um, are both sponsored athletes. You guys are both sponsors, co- sponsored competitors. James, it comes from your. Um, your time in the shooting sports that you're obviously action shooting sports that you are um, a sponsored athlete. Zach, you are sponsored because of your performance in the tactical games. And I think probably also because of who you are um, as a human being, what you do for a living ties in with a lot of that as well. Um, one of the topics of discussion that people always kind of want to know and are, are after and chasing, we talked about this a lot. We talked about it with shot show specifically is sponsorship. Um, you know, I, Gil and I have had extensive conversations about this. So, um, first off, Gil, I'd like to hear from your perspective as somebody who was who's worked on the sponsoree side of things, right? Like helping select teams, helping kind of yep. go in that. What is it that you're looking for when you're looking for athletes that are going to be part of a team, or if you're a sponsor, what what are they looking for? So, so several things. As an individual looking to have people represent my brand or my company out amongst the community. I don't care about your match performance. I mean, a lot of people are worried about that. Like, Hey, I've been shooting for a while. I've been winning. That really doesn't translate. Well, it's important, right? It's good. If you're winning, it's good. If you're strong or you're a phenomenal shooter, but for the most part, like as a sales rep, your job is to go out and advertise a product. And there's nothing better than being an expert in that product. So most of the companies that I've been affiliated with over the years, I used their product or was somewhere tied to the company for multiple years before I ever got any sort of sponsorship endorsement. Yep. Um, you're, you know, like I said, just because you're winning doesn't mean you should be getting sponsored. Uh, we want people that are approachable. So when we go to the match, right, this today while we're out there, um, I can tell you there's a lot of events that I've gone to over the years where somebody has a ton of logos on their jersey and you go ask them about a product, they don't know anything about it. You go ask them for advice or guidance on anything, they just don't want to talk to you. And it's like, okay, are you here to win or are you here to talk and socialize? Like, I want to know about what you're using. Like, yeah. I, I'm approaching you for a particular reason. I'm asking you about what you're using. So that that is really important. Are you willing to be involved with the community? And going to the other side as a sponsored athlete or shooter i know that my job is not to just receive stuff because i'm amazing right? like <laughs> here are your my free mom things. says I'm, the, 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 <laughs> I'm a handsome boy right so but my job is to sell product to represent that product and i kind of i know that i fit into a, a different network there where i personally i don't really want to deal with sales you know it's a necessary evil but my big role with people is I want to make sure people have the best information possible. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I think that translates well for a lot of people. So over the years, the last 15, 18 years, I've been in the, in the shooting sports. Uh, that's the number one question I get is how do I get sponsored? And I'm like, well, what, if you can't answer the question of why do you think you should get sponsored? I can't help you. Right. You know, it, it, are you approachable? Are you a, a good human being? Like, you know, it, it, we do it with our kids growing up, doing Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, doing youth sports and everything else. I don't care if you win. I want you to be a quality human being going forward. That is primary for me. So there's a lot of companies I've worked with or refused to work with over the years where I don't endorse a product. I don't endorse a company. There's th- certain things there. And so that there's a lot that ties into that when it comes to sponsorship. Um, and you know, on the shooting side of the house, there's a lot of companies that won't approach the shooting sports. I mean, for Under Armour to come on board this past year was a huge deal. Like yeah. never in my wildest dreams would I thought like a big company like that would be anywhere associated with two A. 
Um, cause it's such a taboo thing. So it's, it's nice to have people that are willing to support what we're doing. And in return, I have to go out of my way to make, make an effort to show off the product, be a solid human being for right. them. So that's a big thing with sponsors. I mean, you're, you're an ambassador of the brand, right? Yep. Like that's what you're out there doing. You're, you're just showing and demonstrating to them why their products deserve to be in the space or why they are legitimate, right? And I think that's, Zach, from your perspective, you lend legitimacy to a lot of the products and a lot of the sponsors that you have, right? So mm -hmm. why don't you talk about some of the sponsors that you have first and then we'll, uh, we'll dive into a little bit of why they, you think they supported you. So Blackhawk picked me up two years ago. Um, I remember, I remember when it happened. It was uh, 2021 national championship. Was it uh, RPR? Yep. I think. Yep. And they grabbed some video footage or whatever. But I had been care. I had been using an omnivore because uh, I shot. I was shooting a, a double stack, and I always shoot with a light on my gun. Anyways, at work, and uh, and you know the, the the people that were my you know my contacts, Casey and, and Courtney and George, and them they were phenomenal. Awesome people. people uh, yeah. I went to Montana. I, I got to see the um, the operations, how the holsters are made, how some of the product was made. Y'all were there. Uh, yeah, I was there with you. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to hold my hand. <laughs> Do you remember that? I, I watched that video every day. What rejection feels like. Yeah, I know. Get used to it. So I we went through the factory. It was an awesome facility, an awesome manufacturing plant. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to go to several manufacturing uh, facilities for the sponsors that you know I shoot for. Um, but Blackhawk, they do it right, and uh, they've always treated me well. But it's easy for me to shoot for them. Like it just it makes sense. I I use their product. Um, some of the first gear I was ever issued was Blackhawk. Yeah, as, the as dynamic a, entry as a stuff. SWAT guy. Yeah, yeah. I swung their you know their breaching tools for many years. Um, I, I've I've used their holsters, uh, gloves, entry gloves, repelling gloves. Uh, they do a, they do a ton of stuff, and uh, it's it was kind of. It was pretty neat for me to get picked up by them when that was the first gear that I was ever issued yeah. as a SWAT guy. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of surreal. Anyway, so yeah. obviously Blackhawk was a natural fit, right? Because yeah. of what you do for work and because you had experience using it in the field. Now Under Armour, when they approached you about sponsorship, that was obviously something different. That was like a whole different animal, right? Yeah, I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, my <laughs> kids, I, I grew up like, you know, I think in college I bought my first pair of Under Armour shorts. It was like when Protect This House was yeah, big and they had this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, had cut off, I had a cut off shirt with no arms. Yeah, with it. Yeah. Uh, but my boys walk around in it all the yeah. time. You know, it's like what their school clothes are and their, right. their uniforms and stuff. So to be able to shoot for a company that's like already all over my house is wild. Yeah. Um, but you know, Chris Cook's been real good to me as well. Yep. Um, the the communication is awesome. I I will say for the for the people that I that I am sponsored by that support me. Um, and I use their product like they're really good. Um, they have great customer service and that's I know that You know, you've been around a lot of companies for a long time. That's a hard thing to get an email back from some people. Yeah um, or, or going on a trip and getting on a boat with somebody like yeah, so I you mean, talk about being in with a company that's all over your house all the time So it wasn't just like oh, what can I get from this company? It's something that you already use and trust, you know Blackhawk so you're in with those companies and it's People don't realize the value of like this is a reciprocal relationship. Like, yep. Yeah. I trust you. You trust me. Like you want me to represent you. I've been using your stuff for these reasons, not because you tell me to, but because I was already yeah. using them. Right. Yeah. It's huge. That's a big part of it too. It's like, and we are selective about the sponsors that we take on in the sport because there have been people and in, in companies that have come into the space that have shit products. And then people have something negative to say about them, and then that reflects on us, how they felt yep. about that product, right? So when it comes to the companies that we select as sponsors and that select us, it's a mutual agreement that we are willing to work with one another. And uh, I think that approach has been very successful for us. We go after the companies that are willing to support us because they're willing to support our, our community and the people that compete in our sport. So it's one of the big things that we always ask is that if you're looking, if you're in the market, if you're a competitor in the tactical games and you need to buy something new, I'm not asking you to go out and buy something just because they're a sponsor, but if you're going to buy something new, look to our sponsors first. Yeah. Look to the people that are going to, that are putting money back into this space to ensure that it continues to grow and continues to evolve into the next level, which is what I think we're all searching for, right? We all want to continue to see more people in the shooting sports, continue to see people getting fit, continue to see people getting motivated to do something like this. But it's not like you're bringing on sponsors or companies that are not good, reputable 
companies that make great equi equipment. Like 100%. Equipment. No, no, no. I've been trying to get certain sponsors to come on board for years now, if anybody's interested. Um, I've ingested tons of their Reese's peanut butter cups, <laughs> as well as Holiday. Holiday variants. What, which, what, okay, so you asked, Here we or it go. came up. It's on. What is the number one Reese's peanut butter cup? I'm going to start a fight. I can tell. Because I just had one the other day. My mom got it, dropped it in my car. And it's the big cup, right? And they have, everybody's trying to get, they're trying to get real creative, like putting puffs and pretzels in them. There's one with caramel in it. And it about knocked me out. Better like, than done. the Easter eggs. I don't know about that. Dude, the Easter eggs. I'm going to have to have them side by side <laughs> with the half gallon of milk to keep me up. Almond but, milk? No. Zach came up to me last night. Zach has never Here had almond go. milk in his entire life. And Zach came up to me last night and said, hey, can I try some almond milk? <laughs> no offense to people that have to drink almond milk, but he put me out in the gas station. So <laughs> imagine going through life not being able to drink milk. I, I Hey, listen. I hear be you. terrible. <laughs> So, back on it. All right. Um, so, we have something exciting coming up in the next January. Um, I think we're all going to be out at SHOT Show. How stoked are you to finally make your way out there? Um, I'm pretty pumped. Yeah? I've been trying to weasel my way there for a while, but I can't, <laughs> seem, to, can't seem to get there. But it's happening this year. I heard that uh, it's pretty good for your immune system. It takes a hit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's all I hear a lot of. Yeah. Everybody's shaking, you, shaking you, hands and coughing. and Get a hit the IV bar? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucky for me, my kids have put me through the gauntlet, you know, through school, whatever they bring home from school. I'm probably, I'll probably just be just fine. We're going to be going to uh, the Sphere one night too. Are you excited about that? I don't know what to expect. To yeah. be honest with you, it'd probably be all right. It'd be fun. <laughs> I, I, so I landed in Vegas um, when I went and, and shot Utah with my uh, my middle son. Yeah. And it's just like plopped out in the middle of a desert crazy and then we left and went to utah and it was like barren for a while yeah but i'm pretty desert we drove through it we drove through it and uh there were people getting, we were going to get our picture next to the vegas sign but there's this long line and i'm like we're getting out of here there's a lot of people here so i'll probably uh i'll probably i'll be really excited to be there to see um to see what the under armor booth looks like I it's, cool. it's going to be awesome yeah what, what all says. of the things that you've ever heard about vegas we don't do it <laughs> yeah. you want to avoid that <laughs> Yeah, there's not like, I think I gambled for a total of like an hour and a half last time I was there for five I days. Be gambling. Don't wear boots. Gel insoles. Yeah. No wear shit. something yeah. super comfy. Uh, know that if you're not sleeping correctly, the show is gonna be miserable for you. Miserable because you're on the floor for twelve hours. Twelve hours. Yeah. And, and you're you're gonna log some some miles. So check check the pedometer. We're we're gonna get some steps in. Everybody that walks up to you is also gonna be like, annihilated. Yeah. Because you're bigger weird. than everybody out there. It's all people from the shooting industry. They're not going to know what to do with you. They're not used to seeing like people, freak athletes out there. People are short in the shooting industry. I, it's a common fact. So. Do you know have, they have a booth <laughs> with uh, the original uh, Incredible Hulk? With, uh, the Hulk hands? Who's the, the original oh, actor? Lou Frigno? Lou Frigno. Yeah. So every year in and front Chuck of... Chuck Liddell was out there last yeah, year too. In front of the, the loophole booth, they have Lou Frigno sitting there signing autographs. And I've had multiple people like, who's this guy? And I'm like, that's the Hulk. Like, why is he here at Shot Show? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> Nobody knows. But like, if you go talk to him, he'll pick you up. Like, <laughs> so, oh, we should, I think we should just make you pick people up at yeah. Shot Show. I feel like it's a bad idea. Um, no, <laughs> I feel no, like no. it's not a good no. idea. It's, I'm sign waivers. Are you going to be there Thursday night? I don't know. When are you flying out? I'll fly out Thursday. Thank oh. goodness. Apparently, the cry party I think would have been an interesting thing to bring you to. Oh. The what? Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. So it's a different year, but. <laughs> There's some events in previous times where you can crush cars with tanks. You can throw snowballs at people driving mini bikes. Yep. Last year there was a roller coaster. I won't be getting on one of those. <laughs> but I'll take like free samples of food and snacks that any of the booths want to give me. <laughs> oh. um, well, so another thing that we're we're going to talk about is kind of the the shooting industry at large. Um, I think that. Obviously, James, you've been involved in the shooting industry for quite some time. Yep. Um, now, you've been, Zach, you're new to the shooting sports. I mean, I'm new to the shooting sports as well. Um, you've been in law enforcement for 16 years. But, you know, my experience outside of, after the military was, I worked in the defense industry, but not directly in the shooting industry. So one of the things that I've seen since I've been in the shooting industry 
is the division of different people inside of it based on what they think is the appropriate means to like shoot, right? Like if you're like you're a tactical shooter, yep. Uh, you've got cry, you wear your cry precision pants, right? Like then there's like the video game shooters, then there's like the the old school like what's the cowboy action shooting? Like you name it, there's all these different factions of people in the shooting industry. And it seems like the infighting is one of the biggest reasons why shooting sports individually in different parts of the shooting industry never seem to grow in totality because they're just constantly cutting one another down in different aspects of it. So like, I mean, is that something that you guys have seen since you've been here? Like that's what the message boards and stuff all look like. Anything on that? Do you mean like, Company wise or shooter, like I, I'm talking about just kind of all over the board. It seems like when when you go, it used to be really common on the tactical game stuff. Like this isn't tactical, yeah. right? And because people didn't see what we were doing as having a practical application. I think that sometimes people, when they don't understand something, it intimidates them a little bit, maybe, sure. um, and they don't know how to process it, and so they bristle. Right. Um, I'm used to like like today. You know, you even made a comment about it. Like, I didn't, I wasn't like pouty or whatever when I failed. Like, I enjoy failing yeah. because it means yeah. that there's more for me to learn. Yeah. Um, like, how fun would it be to go through life and be great at everything? It's tough. I'm not, I don't love it. You know, <laughs> I wonder how you sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> but, but truly, I mean, it's a thing. Like, when you, when, when you don't understand something, you tend to kind of like maybe take offense or put it a defensive posture of for sure yourself. well i mean one of the things that like came up recently um nick palacios got a punisher skull engraved on the side of his staccato p and uh like the internet lost its fucking mind but some of the funniest comments i've oh. ever seen <laughs> hey frank i saw what happened to your family i'm really sorry <laughs> <laughs> I, I i blew him up on the comments call the other day. i had to do it and so i mean i, I can tell you shooting multiple matches over the you know any shooting if you can pull the trigger i've shot it yeah single action cowboy yeah. i'm looking for a man who shot my paw <laughs> you know to precision rifle uh any of the sporting clays trap ski five stand any of that i've shot at the highest levels and what i've noticed from each of those communities is every time i go to one of those events if you go jump in and participate everybody loves you and then as soon as you say I like this, but I think I'm going to go over here instead. That's when they start bashing and fighting. Yep. And I, I don't understand it because for most of the people in our community, when it comes to the shooting sports, they're a hobby. Right? Yeah. It's, you know, a lot of people look at their Second Amendment freedoms, home defense, and, you know, general firearms rights. But when we go to the highest levels of action shooting or sports shooting, it's so specialized that it becomes kind of out of this world for a lot of people. And so they don't understand it. And they're like, well, why would you do this? And I'm like, I don't know. Why do you play golf? Yeah. Like it's fun, but I can't, well, I guess I could defend myself with a golf club if I had to in New York where, but like, anyway, so like those, those shooting sports, I've noticed that every one of those sports, the kids that come up in those sports are all solid humans yeah like my, my niece is doing uh trap and five stand sport clays right now she's up in northern wisconsin she's 17 years old she's on the varsity wrestling team she drives she is the most all-american kid you'll ever meet and like we you know i've gone to trap practice with her when i'm up in town and doing different stuff but like her taking the side by side to go to practice by herself herself with a shotgun or a rifle when she's going to hunting season you know some people look at that and they're like, oh, there's a 17 year old girl running around with a gun and doing, and like, she's safe. She's like, yep, straight A's, got all, and like, this is what we want from those communities. And so, where they start bickering with each other about what's harder, man, it's so tough. But again, like, we talked about this with like law enforcement or military. When you have guys branch out to something that they're not good at, you, yep. they do one of two things. They say, well, this isn't realistic. This is it's, bullshit. It checked my ego, so I'm out of here. Yep. And, you know, the, the people that hit that wall of negative performance and say, I don't like what I did. I want to get better. And they start reaching out to the highest authorities, anybody they can, like, how can I be better at this? Like, that's, that's what makes all of these sports the level that they are. Like, why do you have Olympic athletes that are 
dominating the world circuit or doing certain things. Like they are masters of something because they got gut checked at one point or another. Yep. Oh yeah. And I mean that's incredible. Like the development for products across the industry has become light years ahead of what it should have been because of that competition. Um, you know, the performance within each sport, like if you have a minimum standard and that's all you have to meet, well, that's all you're going to do. Right. But now when it's like, well, let's see how far we, we talked about this for the games. Like, let's see how strong you can be. Let's yep. see how far you can run. Let's see how well you can actually shoot. Like let's stretch peak performance. Let's see what that actually looks like. And then you start seeing some insane results. Yep. No. Instead of just like setting a standard, or like instead of just meeting a standard, becoming the standard. I, I showed up on time. Yeah, <laughs> what, we've watched it like evolve, like it. It's almost like it sped up. As oh it yeah, was evolving. So yeah. like I remember there was a time when I think it was twenty nine. I think it was twenty nineteen in North Carolina. Um, there was a hundred fifty pound sandbag introduced. Yeah, and it was a graveyard. I'm like, what? <laughs> What was happening here? But this then is not even a human size it sandbag. A, you know, it was like yeah, and it, the guys were rolling like rolling the bag, yeah, like, and then laying next to it and then rolling it some more. Like, uh, but the now, intermediate like, is one hundred and fifty is just that we do. Yeah, like the intermediate does one hundred and fifty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can do one hundred and fifty. So it's been that's been fun to watch, actually. Uh, watching the evolution of the strength in the sport has been. I, I the think you changed too. Everything has changed. Well, you you have to make it harder. People once they have reached a level of proficiency then you push it a little bit harder. Mm-hmm. And the ones that understand that what you're trying to do is make them better in that, they keep coming back. It's the ones that are used to a certain level of performance based on the amount of effort that they're willing to put into it. Yep. And then when you make it like, all right, time to put in a little bit more effort. No, I don't want to put in more effort. I don't want to do anything else more than what I've been doing. But I think it matters. I think when you come to the tactical games with a certain mentality, like what do you expect to get out of this? Are yeah. you expecting to get better? As a person or whatever you're so doing. So many people show up. Or are you up, just here to win? They legitimately think they're going to show up and win. Like, I, I'm not here to, like, lay down and chill. I'm like, oh, I'm no. trying to win, too. No, I've seen But I'm try. also getting some other... Once? A lot out of this on top of... You know, you know what we should start <laughs> doing for these events? Especially with new shooters. New competitors. Yeah. Right? New athletes to the sport. We do a pre-game interview with them. Like it's Squid Games or something. And they're like, oh, I'm going to come here. I'm going to crush everybody. Tell us what you think your placement's going to oh, be. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they just... Tell, and, and then we do their post game interview. And like, <laughs> it's a little slice of humble pie. Well, it was really not. This like, is a tactical. Man, Zach is actually a big dude. <laughs> yeah. Or, oh, God dang. Like, watching these ladies run. Like, and I was a half their time. Like, yeah. oh, my God. Like, whoo. Uh, that's uh, um, one of my favorite things about this sport has been watching the evolution in the short time that I've been involved. And I mean, like, three years is not a long time to be involved with something, but watching people get better and that. that that level, that median level of athlete continue to rise and we're getting more people. So we know that not there's one people coming in, have a, having a higher level of fitness and shooting standard, but two, the people in the sport continuing to push their own personal abilities. I think that's been huge. I mean, I've seen it personally. I, I'm sure Zach, you've seen it in your shooting and pro- the fitness side of the house. I'm sure more on the endurance side than the strength side. But when you came in, you were doing amateur strongman, right? How like what was your mile of run time when you first started? I don't remember. But here's a fun fact that many don't know: is I ran, I used to run cross country in high school. However, I was like 180 pounds when I ran. Uh, but breathing is all the same, right? So, yeah. Um, I've came. It's funny because my body has changed several times with the evolution of the tactical games. I've showed up 250, 250 255, 260 pounds yep. early on, and then you know recently sitting around 240 and i have some goals for this year i'm gonna i'm gonna see what that 200 what that body no i'm not gonna do 200 <laughs> i'm not gonna be a victim of it. so uh i'm gonna probably stay so that i can my wife will let me in the house <laughs> uh, but no I'll, i will get i'll probably get a little bit lighter just to kind of see you know what that threshold is of losing you know i'll, I'll give up a little bit to get a little faster i watched you so zach and i did a workout yesterday and the workout was four rounds with a descending rep count of sandbags that started at 100, went to 250, um, the final round being two reps at 250. And then I died at the last round and was so glad it was over. And you pulled off a 300 pound sandbag and then did a fifth round with two reps at 300 pounds faster than I think I ripped the 200 pound off the ground. 
and you were pretty, I, I just flexed on me over top of my corpse as I was lying down on the ground and then stepped over and walked away. I got, I've been saving that smoke. I haven't been able to give it. <laughs> I haven't been able to give that smoke to Hepner. I haven't been able to give that to you, but it's coming. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so I got 200 at Mayhem. You did? Yeah. 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 So it was on, it's documented, but uh, anywhere else, like, yeah, let's take it with 150. <laughs> <laughs> when, when money's on the line, 150. <laughs> you know what has been fun is uh, my coach at, at our CrossFit gym at home has, the way that he programs, um, my, my conditioning, my motor has been built, like, over the last year. Uh, being able to, so I remember watching um, Halbert and Hepner. it was a variation of the Enman. I think it was last year. Um, we were all beat up by that time of the weekend, but... But I watched them running with a 200 pound bag. Yeah. On like round three. Yep. And I'm like, I like I can move bags like no problem, but like the pace at which they were moving was unbelievable. So offensive. So yeah, it was it was absolutely <laughs> disrespectful. Um, and I'm like, I need that. Yeah. Like I need that gear. Yeah. And so I spent the last year. That's all you know that I worked towards. So. I'm excited to to see it pop up at some point, maybe this year with a, with an axle workout or or bag workout or something. But uh, the later the rounds go, I, I like to feel stronger. Um, and I I think the bike workout was a, was a good one too. I love the bike that workout. Was awesome. That was Same one of my thing. favorite stages that we've done. At the Just trying rooms. to hang on. I wish uh, the the range dictated us only having 150 yards. I wish that was a 200 yard shot. I think I that would have been don't incredible. Wish that, but <laughs> just staying awake. At the end. I, I'm going to throw this challenge out again. I threw it out, I, I think, on another podcast that we did, or maybe it was on a live stream. Um, I challenge anybody to go on an Echo Bike, a Rogue Echo Bike, and do one minute of max calories on that Echo Bike, and then take a minute rest, and then repeat that three more times. You better have a medic on. <laughs> hey, we'll, give you, we'll give you two minutes rest. We'll yeah, give you two take, minutes rest. Two, take two minutes rest. And see if you can hit the same calorie count four times in a row. The uh, average that I saw was 30 Willie won that workout. He got 45 or 47 calories in the first round and then was down to like 38 and then never dropped below 30. Willie, 45 calories in a minute Willie's on an echo bike is impressive. I want, you to bring, I, want to, I want to see the ski erg come back. The ski erg. <laughs> you the broke ski, every ski erg. The ski erg and the partner event in West Virginia was awesome. So, so I got to ask both you guys on certain events where, you know, when you're competing or when you're doing workouts, you know, you said it, you told me in West Virginia before, I think the team... Uh, bag the two minute uh, floater stage, right? Okay. Yeah, and you kind of knew what the competition score was, and you looked at me and you said, I'm "Fucking going dark," right? And I'm like, "Okay," and so like snorted pre workout, yeah, and just went after it. And there, there's uh, certain things where you know I've talked to people over the years about different events, like how do you do this? What do you do? I'm like, I don't know. I just kind of done my way through it, or. I know that I don't have an option, right? In, in, in the military side of the house, there's some times where you really don't have an option. You yep. just have to do it. LE, same thing. Um, and so when it comes to these workouts, where there's, you know, if you have the strongman background where you're used to picking up heavy stuff, which is expected of you, now when you hit the side of the house, whether it's whatever you would say is your uncomfortable zone, whether it's long distance running or the finesse action shooting, whatever it is, whenever you find your uncomfortable zone, how do you get through that? So you can't, I've, I've preached this you know, to my boys a lot. You can't expect to access that extra gear or the dark place or wherever we joke around about. Yeah. You can't expect to access that if you're not like dipping your feet in the water during your normal training. Yeah, uh, it cannot be completely foreign to you. And a lot of people are, are really great athletes, and they're really good, like you know, fitness people or whatever. But they're just not willing to like maybe not be awake for a minute. Yeah, like risk just yeah whatever. Um, and then you know, for some of us, it's an emotional outlet. Um, try, I know for me, I don't, I don't, I don't drink. I don't, I don't smoke. I never have. I don't take any medications. Uh, I limp around before I'll take an ibuprofen. If I ever need it, I want it to work. But but I don't my outlet probably in place of some sort of weird nerve medication is fitness. Um, I'm able to dump whatever whatever frustrations or, or whatever into the workout. And uh, sometimes like when you when I when I'm out there and it's I know that it's a short window where I can just go 
mindless. I don't have to worry about a shooting iteration or whatever. Then you can you can jump in the water, and uh, those are those are probably my favorite because those are the ones where you can slow down and nobody really knows like if you're slowing down oh, yeah, or if yeah. you're tired. They can't tell, but you know, outside. yeah, and you know on the drive home that you slowed down, right? Or the flight home, or when you get back to your gym, you're like, man, I maybe had a little bit more, and I just I'm just not willing. To have that conversation and that little bit more is the difference and we've seen it like uh raton well, how close was that match between you and jay it was a bullet it was 10 10 seconds yeah so that 10 seconds you're, you're constantly going back and looking at it like what could i have done either yeah. in my training mm-hmm. or in the match to make up for that 10 mm-hmm. seconds because that, that's a that's a kick in the dick that's not an easy thing mm-hmm. to, to i take would home. rather make a mis- i would rather make a mistake like you an know, egregious, like a, yeah, yeah, as yeah. opposed to an effort based, like, yeah, I should have went harder, yeah, right, or I shouldn't you have shot paced. the wrong target, yeah. I would like, rather, yeah. and that's kind you know, that yeah. happens, but you can't. The things that you can control, I tell my kids on their baseball team, like, we can control, we can always control our attitude and how we react to things, and we can always control our hustle 100%. Um, and so, like, they're watching, that's why to me, like, people hate burpees, gosh, burpees are one of the best things in the world that you can do because no listen to me no matter what no matter what you can stand back up you can stand back up no it sucks but you are going to get up off that ground if maybe. you have the desire to do it you are going to get up off that ground maybe now as many burpees as we had at nationals is not what i was planning on happening I but like, i, I like do we think tested that well i do think that burpees are something that you are never going to see go away from this space yeah. no jump you always hit the ground yeah. right <laughs> you always hit the ground when you jump burpees there's a few times where i'm just like i'll just yeah. stay here <laughs> I don't have this sandbag is comfy right now <laughs> yeah for me finding uh finding things whether it's in training or in competition that i absolutely hate um those are the things that i go back and i'll work on and it, I know that if I'm not good at it, if I don't like it, I need to do it more. Um, running was a big one for that for me. I hated running. Yep. And I got to the point where I was an okay runner. And that was my goal is I didn't want to hate it. I didn't want to start it and like get there and be like, that was a thing that I, that I hated. Um, I like finding those things. And then at least once a week, what I'll do is I will, I will go and do those things. I'm going to put myself in that uncomfortable position because when it comes up in competition, I want to know that I've got the ability to do it. It used to be like thrusters. When there were thrusters programmed in a workout, I, I hated doing it. I absolutely hated thrusters doing it. Thrusters are not fun. They're terrible. They're terrible. And it doesn't matter. Like, they can be light. They can be heavy. They're never fun to do. But if they're in a workout, like, I know I need to do that workout. I know that when I show up, typically, at one of these events, you know, whether it be a regional or a nat- especially the national championship, there's going to be some things that we're just not good at. Yeah. And... And that's kind of why, like, I think most of us are showing up yeah. because we want to, we're not there sometimes for necessarily like the exercise, but we're there to try to access that part of who we are to see if it's, we still got it yeah. in there and to make sure that we dust it off in case we need it and other, you know, parts of our life. For sure. Um, one other thing that I wanted to talk about now is getting outside of the elite division. Right. This is something that, uh, you know, a lot of our people that, that follow the sport there, there's always been talk about like the elite division gets the most publicity. It's the one people talk about as well. As sponsorships go. Now, James, you don't compete in elite. No. You know, I, I am at the very hairy edge of being able to compete in elite physically. I think as the sport probably next year or the year after, I'm, I'm not going to be able to compete physically. I won't have the ability to do it anymore. Zach, you're getting at the top. End. I mean, you're over 40 now. So you're qualified to go into the next, into Masters 40 plus. Coming from being an elite competitor, coming from being an elite competitor in other action shooting sports, what value do you find in going into a a division that isn't necessarily like the top division in a sport? There's still something there, right? Like, why do you still come out and compete even though you're not competing in elite? So I've had multiple people very close to me ask me this over the years. Why do you do this sport? Why do you do this sport that is so physically demanding? Um, there's very little tangible reward for it. And, um, you know, it's it's one thing when I come in and like, oh, Gil, you, you know, for shooting so good. And, of course, you're going to do shooting good. But when it's like I'm expected to do well in this, you throw a big bag around. But when you get 
credit for doing something that you had to put way more effort yeah. into. What didn't come naturally for you? You know, the physical side of the house, that's what the sweat was coming in. Um, you know, it, it's tough to say exactly why I do. Like, I like the challenge. Um, I don't really, I, I don't know what that addiction is for me. But seeing, you know, I've competed in intermediate, uh, I've competed in tactical. I'm very closely following all of divisions, yep. mainly for programming. You know, I have athletes that I felt like I really like to people watch and look at performance, right? Yep. So um, it's a little easier to pay attention to performance gains in, let's say, the female divisions because they're smaller. Yeah. You have uh, repeat contenders or, or athletes in those divisions. Um, but as we're looking at each of those, like – the athletes that you have in the intermediate division versus the elite division, they're still phenomenal athletes. You know, we, um, who'd you partner with in West Virginia? Katie? Uh, like the oh, uh, 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 my partner in West Virginia, uh, Maddie. Maddie. Maddie from, uh, yeah, 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 Maddie. Just ran laps around you on the long run stage. She's like <laughs> looking at her watch, like 15 minutes later, Nick will be in on the rook. Like, okay, like, <laughs> you know, she's catching her breath. And so you have people that come in and they're in a division that might not get the recognition, but they're phenomenal athletes. We see it in CrossFit or any of those other sports where the Masters or Masters Plus, like, oh, well, they don't count. This person is the top 1% oh, yeah. worldwide for their age bracket. And they like it's often lost, but it's um, – I like seeing the dog fights in each of the divisions. And I've been coaching several people to include Tina where we're looking at, Hey, you're coming in and you're competing against once you get into a similar skill set with athletes and you, you know that like the people that you're with are not new competitors. Right. right. That's why elite is so competitive because you have so many repeat athletes yep. that are figuring the game out. They're working on their strengths and, you know, mastering it. But, um, you know, the intermediate, you have a high turnover of athletes. I've been in the sport for five years. I'm not a, I'm not a turnover athlete. So the guys that I'm competing with and you see the same faces, they're just smaller framed or they're new shooters or, you know, they all have different attributes, but like they're still putting in the same amount of time in the gym. They're still putting the same amount of time on the range, work, you know, money for the sport, whatever it is. And, and I'm, I'm, completely okay with the brackets working out you know if you want to call it masters or master plus and like oh that's the boomer squad well they're actually my favorite squad actually but they you know um as you look at each of the divisions there's a known standard for that division and then as people come in and once the division fills up it becomes ultra competitive um and realistically i know you know specifically for myself being severely disabled there are some things like I am not going to dunk on a 10 foot rim. I'm not getting a contract at the NBA. I don't care how bad I can cross you over. I'm not getting signed. And, and I don't look so great in a pair of basketball shorts anyway. <laughs> but, um, and so like, okay, I'm okay with this. And um, when you have some of the divisions that, that break out into different, I can call them skill sets, but different size categories, you know, I, I promise you, you can take athletes from the elite division and the intermediate division and put them together on a single skill set, and the scores change completely. Sure, yeah. Um, and that that's kind of one of the neat things about the sport. And so when we have a di direct comparison where you can look stage to stage on the single skill type stages, like the long ruck yep. runs and stuff, you'll see a time where the top 10 athletes at uh, the overall at the event are not the elite competitors. Sure. They're not, you know, hey, on this stage... Uh, Masters was top. He had four athletes in the top ten in this division. Yep. Oh, okay. That like, and people start looking like, why is that? You know, and, and it's like, hey, this is a skill thing. This is uh, some gray matter. You know, experience pays dividends here. For sure. Well, I think that's one of the things that we see. Like in the elite division, it takes time in your day. It takes sacrifice. It takes dedication. It's not. It, it is very tough to come in there and just compete at a high level in that division. Yep. Um, unless you are dedicating time and effort every day into the gym and into shooting. Um, can you go in there and do it? Yeah, sure. I think there's a lot of people that can go in there and do it. But to, to be truly competitive in that division, you need to put the work in. And that's no different than the top of the 40-plus division, the top of the 50-plus division, the top of the um, tactical or intermediate division. 
the people that are winning those are putting work in, like you said. It's just a different style based on what division you're in. Well, I mean, two athletes that come to mind, Willie. Yeah. Zach here, both over 40. Yep. Still competing and being ultra competitive in the elite division. Yep. When they clearly aged out, right? Like Willie, no, you I think can look at Zach's face and see how yeah, old he is. Like, yeah. it's, it's you look 71. Yeah. Zach is 26. <laughs> Night shift, right? Yeah. yeah right. So, like, you, you have guys that are outside of the age category for it and still competing with the 25, 26 year old athletes, yep. RX plus. And, and so, like, if people don't respect, like, hey, that is significant amount of effort. That you know that that's above you know it's it's like dealing with somebody that's never rolled an ankle. You're like, ah, I know what you're going through. Oh, have you recovered? From, you know before. Yeah. You know, like, Speaking of recovery, that's I think that's the biggest thing. Being an, an older, a hundred percent. Yeah, that's recovery science. Recovery is hard. Yeah, you know. As you get older, you don't There's recover a couple as well. Twenty-eight year olds at a couple of these <laughs> matches, and they're you we know I can do we can do what they can do, but like they're up running around, joking around, and we're like. Uh, so Hepner, <laughs> I think Hepner's 31 or 32 years old. There's a eight year age difference between you and him. So like his ability to recover, his natural testosterone, the things that he's producing, he's going to recover better than you. But I can ride all the rides at the park. Yeah, you're alive because of your height. You can get out <laughs> anything. Uh, but Sorry. You, there, there's Sorry definitely like, I, I'm glad that, that people are starting to see and understand the value in the other divisions. Because I think early on there was a stigma that if you weren't competing in elite, you weren't competing. But that's not the case at all. I mean, the tactical division, as far as its competitors inside of it, it's probably one of the most competitive divisions inside our sport. Because it's like from first to 20th place, kind of anybody in that could win. It's one of the larger fields, for sure. So you have, you're you going to have a larger number of athletes going into it. The weight in there is still tough. I mean, yep. They do a 200-pound bag in yep. Georgia for the Inman. Uh, 200 pound for nationals as well. Yep. So that's the heaviest weight tactical is done. Uh, you have, you know, some new athletes coming into the sport that are phenomenal with both shooting and fitness. Um, it, I think it's, I think tactical is probably the biggest tough division, right? Um, and it, I signed up for it for Florida this year and I'm just hoping to be, a survivor, right? Um, and hoping not, not doing like six mile runs or whatever. I don't know. What I'm we're programming do. a six mile run right now. I think. The, I think that. I think the elite. I mean, division, it's not. It's Florida. It's Florida. <laughs> the, the elite division in itself is is an, an awesome thing. Like it's the unknown. Yeah. You have yeah. unknown athletes that are going to be phenomenal. Yep. Um, and my parents, you know, inspired me from a young age to do things that you're, you know, that are unknown and scary and. You know, my, my wife stays on me. She won't let me punk out if I if I want to go slower or whatever. I remember when I got my IV right before I got the IV yeah. in my arm. Oh. She's like, you're running a 16-minute mile. I'm like, I don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> Who are you, lady? Who are you? I, why is she yelling at me? <laughs> but it's a good division to find to find those things. But You can't stay forever. It's just how it is. Yeah, you're going to age out eventually. Yeah. Maybe when you turn 60. I'm not done yet. <laughs> that, I will say that is probably... The most unique thing about the elite division where there's multiple events where conditions unknown okay here's your second lap pick up a ruck for this second lap yeah right? oh yeah. yeah you know ivy on the wall but the, that's what's awesome 12 you know? mile run. that's what's awesome about it yeah well keep on pushing it all right so for those of you out there if anybody's looking for an opportunity to uh take a shot at gill or take a shot at zach it sounds like they're both going to be competing at florida this year so now is an opportunity to come out and uh, see what these two are made of. So thank you all very much, and uh, we'll see you guys soon.